Okay, well, welcome everybody to the 11th week of the uh, Business of Healthcare chat and uh, show now on Blab. Uh, really excited about this week's uh, group of guests. Uh, we're going to be talking about CPC Plus program, the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus, uh, latest model coming out of the CMMI from CMS. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting model. It's got some interesting wrinkles, and we've got some really great folks to come in and tell you all about it and take questions and whatever else we just to get to. So um, with that, I'll hand over to my co-host, Shane. Uh, go ahead and give a quick intro for yourself. We'll run through everyone. Just give a quick 30 seconds for yourself and let everyone know who you are and, and, and what you do. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm glad to be here in the 11th week here. I didn't realize we've been doing this so long. Uh, the idea a number of weeks ago, and I'm glad to see that uh, we've been able to keep it pretty consistent. I'm actually speaking. I'm, I got a little echo here because I'm in an office at the uh, Kaiser uh, Center for uh, uh, Innovation here in D.C. We're having the HL7 Partners in Interoperability Conference, and uh, the focus is all on fire. So uh, I think that might be, uh, I'll just do a quick intro. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about CPC Plus here today, uh, focused on uh, next generation primary care. And one of the interesting things, and, and I, I can intersperse my comment today with uh, what I'm learning here at the HL7 FIRE um, event is that a lot of what we're trying to do in um, comprehensive primary care uh, CCM, um, uh, the models like uh, ACOs, is where Medicare uh, wants to do these as innovation uh, experiments. Uh, so, Don, on uh, your chat, I was watching a little bit on the pre-chat, uh, you know, why is CMS doing uh, some of this? So, that's a, a good question to ask all of our panelists is, why are they doing this? Is, you know, what's, uh, what's going to be the innovation model here? What did they hope to learn? So, those are the kind of things I'm hoping we're going to cover Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Marcy, do you want to give a quick intro for yourself? You bet. My name is Marcy Nielsen. I am the president and CEO at the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. Uh, that's an organization that is uh, centered in Washington, D.C., but we've got about 12,000 folks, uh, organizations all across the country focused on advancing a strong and efficient health system that is uh, grounded in, in primary care, patient-centered primary care. Um, we are comprised of... Uh, First and foremost, healthcare providers um, who, together with payers, uh, back about 10 years ago, decided that our broken health system really needed to be better focused on ways in which to build up and incentivize better primary care. Uh, and to that, over the course of the last several years, we've added a very strong patient slash consumer voice, recognizing that at the end of the day, our our practices are, are really still more provider-centered than they are patient-centered. And so the goal here, and, and certainly CPC Plus, uh, the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus program, is to shift us toward a system that is more patient-centered, patient and family-centered, um, but that better, better incentivizes good care. Uh, and, and we do that through a, a better, more fair system of, of payment for primary care and, and all that it can provide uh, to improve population health, but also to, to better manage healthcare costs. So thank you for including me. Yeah, thank you for coming. That was great. And David, I know this is not your first time on the show, but just a quick intro for everybody here. You might be muted, so. Sorry about that. I am a health hooker, lawyer, and consultant. I'm getting a lot of uh, echo. I can talk. Let me sign off and try and just sign in again. All right, very good. See, Marcy, I told you it'd be a very laid back. It almost has to be because we're always kind of struggling and out in the beginning. So, yeah, like I said, we usually get it worked out and we'll get rolling pretty good. I'm glad it's not just me. We were having technical difficulties on our own webinar yesterday. Gotcha. Hello. All right. Welcome back, David. I'll try this again. I'm a healthcare lawyer and consultant. I've been involved in healthcare for about 25 years or so. And I've been involved in 
entertainment experiments like this one for about 10 years or so, working with providers as well as with payers from time to time, mostly with providers. Some of the things I've worked on on behalf of providers as demos have turned up as regular Medicare, straight ahead Medicare, like the ACO program, things like that. So it's been interesting to see how this has developed over time. All right, excellent. Thank you, Ron. So I'd like to open up with just a, a bit of a general, uh, what is CPC for us? Uh, and just kind of open questions to the group, whoever wants to jump in and get their, their perspective on it for the audience. So I'm happy to jump in. CPC Plus is a new program just announced last week uh, that builds from a program that CMS was testing called the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. That, by the way, is now called CPC Classic for those of you uh, who want to be um, with the cool kids. Um, CPC Classic is, uh, importantly, a multi-payer program. So pulling together Medicare with commercial payers um, and doing that uh, in, in seven different regions across the country with about 500 practices. Um, the goal was, was really to do kind of three things. One, to pay primary care differently and, and better. Um, secondly, to help those practices transform by giving them um, some, some incentives around data alignment, so practices um, getting from the multi-payers data that told them how they were doing relative to some very specific um, guideposts. And then three, giving those practices some opportunities to learn from one another via peer learning. And that program uh, ends this year. It was a four-year program. And they learned a lot of lessons um, about what worked, about what didn't work, um, and and uh, about the, I, I think, um, opportunities we have for primary care to, to really be at the center of health system transformation in a way that this country hasn't hasn't really um, embraced heretofore. And, and so you'll see many of those um, uh, features reflected in CPC Plus, as I mentioned, announced last week. Um, if the old program was designed for 500 practices, the new program is being desi designed for 5,000. So this is a big scale up. Um, and there are some kind of significant differences. Um, the, the most, I think, really is, is that there is an opportunity for a global payment to those practices that are kind of further along in their own transformation process. Um, and that, that global payment is offered to what they're calling track two practices. Um, those track two practices then getting a global payment for um, for. Uh, a set of primary care services that they're going to be providing to patients um, comes with more accountability. And that accountability uh, needs to provide complex patients, high risk, high cost patients with, with more supports. Um, and they're asking the HIT vendor world to participate because we know so often health information technology can be a help, but it can be a hindrance. Um, and then uh, I would say uh, and another uh, another important change that this program has um, from from CPC Classic is uh, they've learned a lot about the importance of data and timeliness of data and giving data back to practices in a way that's actually useful um, versus a, a time lag. Um, and so not only will, will there be more of a push to give practices um, data at the practice level versus at the regional level, but they're going to be paying practices upfront to participate in CPC Plus in a way that they were only providing shared savings um, on the back end to practices before. Excellent, Lori. Thank you for that. Let me just jump, jump in uh, to what we were talking about as far as the uh, uh, interoperability, data exchange, et cetera. It's uh, apropos that I'm sitting here at uh, the Kaiser facility with the HL7 what they're calling the Partners in Interoperability uh, Summit, where they have um, three major groups. The providers are here. And normally that's what uh, HL7 does really well, connecting up uh, with um, a bunch of folks on the uh, EHR and provider side. But uh, what's really terrific is there are two other big groups here. Uh, Pharmaco Genomics guys, so Biopharma is here as a, a specially invited group. And 
work groups are going on trying to figure out how do we exchange data with them. And perhaps even more importantly, especially for CPC Plus, is that the payers are here. So uh, AHIP and their innovation lab uh, just uh, presented uh, on stage a minute ago uh, about what they're doing on micro-targeting and figuring out what are the uh, micro pieces of information that we need to exchange. As, as Marcy said, that without the data exchange, this whole CPC program is just uh, it, it's not necessarily useless, but uh, it's not going to go successful. It's not going to be very successful. So. Uh, at, at a future um, uh, event, uh, maybe on a, on a future HC Biz uh, uh, call, we can talk about what we learned here at the Interoperability uh, Summit between them. The only major players that are missing here are the um, uh, more like the community pharmacies, uh, the, the minute clinic type of folks, those folks that are more attached to pharmacies uh, rather than pharmaceutical, but everybody else is here. and. The one lesson we're seeing here, uh, and this is a two-day summit, uh, plenty of folks, fire is here, it's real, it's working. Uh, I mean, we just saw so many presentations. Uh, it's, it's exciting that uh, the presentations about fire and the API connectivity, uh, very few of them are about what we might do in the future. These are now presentations about what has already happened, what exchanges are taking place, what's working, what's not working, and plenty is not working, so don't get me wrong, I'm not being naive. And, nor am I saying that all these problems are solved, but these challenges about data exchange are real. Uh, and for those that are sitting on the fence wondering whether FHIR uh, has any legs, uh, FHIR is the FHIR that I'm talking about uh, from the HL7 side, uh, you guys should definitely uh, start, uh, uh, at least if your EHR vendors don't know about it already, uh, ask them what their roadmaps look like and if your EHR vendors or any DH, uh, digital health vendors don't know about FHIR or are not planning to integrate with it, uh, it'd be a good time to start looking for new partners there. Uh, so with that, uh, David, I welcome you to talk about uh, overview of CTC Plus as you see it and, uh, and tell us a bit about who should already uh, start. And, and, and Marcy, definitely jump in right after that is from the, uh, they're asking for applications um, mm -hmm. Medicare is asking for applications by June from the payers, and I think by August uh, is what I've been told uh, for the providers. So based on the overview that Marcy gave, what should uh, technology vendors be looking at and thinking about doing? What should providers and payers uh, be doing? Um, and, and maybe that's a great way to have a conversation about uh, what should all, what should we all? Go for it, David. Sure. So I will um, ask you, Marcy, if, as a sort of a first question here, um, my concern about jumping ahead from CPC to CPC Plus is that the two-year review that was recently published in uh, um, JAMA, I think, basically found that there were no um, quality improvements uh, that were statistically significant and that there was a cost increase. But the limitation of that study is that it was limited to Medicare data. And I'm wondering whether your membership has seen improvements in the non-Medicare uh, portion of the initial uh, rollout. Because frankly, if, if they haven't, then why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Well, and this this question comes up a lot, not not just as part of CPC, but as part of all of these PCMH initiatives, patient centered medical homes, um, whether you call them PCMHs, advanced primary care, comprehensive primary care, um, there are some things that they all have in common. One, it's hard work. Um, the what we're asking practices to do are, are to, to fundamentally upend the way they offer care to their patients in terms of workflow um, and in terms of, of patient centeredness. So looking at access, looking at whole person care, integrating behavioral health, connecting um, and coordinating across the medical neighborhood. So helping patients as they as they need to navigate the health system. Um, and uh, to, to Shahid's earlier point, really using technology, not just from an EHR perspective and, and, and clinical data, which, which is, is frankly still very much based on fee-for-service and so not a good platform to really 
drive good patient care, but to also use additional population health tools that help that practice risk stratify and look across their population and say, who's sick, who's not sick? So who needs what services? So back to your specific question, David. So if you're that practice and you're just starting the transformation process, you got a lot of work to do on the front end and that work takes time. Um, just that, that act of integrating electronic health records and using population health tools to, to, to risk stratify your population and then use um, a care manager, whether that's a nurse or a social worker, a community health worker, having somebody on your team be responsible for outreach. Um, all of that is, is is not only time consuming, but to your earlier point, it's also expensive. And so the CPC, the, the, the first two year evaluation, um, found that care management is expensive and the practices need that, uh, that additional assistance in order to offer this care. Um, but I wouldn't say that there was no quality improvements found. Um, one, most, most experts in PCMH transformation um, suspect that, that transformation takes between two to three, three and a half years. So the evaluation for CPC was, was early. Um, but secondly, what we found in those seven regions is a lot of variability. So some regions right. actually had terrific improvements in quality, found cost savings. And when I say cost savings, I mean net savings over and above what, what uh, CMS spent for care management. We're interested in total cost of care savings, not just savings um, on, the, on the back end. Um, and so there were lessons to be learned in looking at those seven regions that are very consistent with the literature in general. And, and what we know, again, back to EHRs, if you don't have a, a fully uh, operational EHR, you're gonna really struggle um, to do this well. Sure. And of course the CPC practices did. That was a that was a requirement that they had that they had EHRs whether they were fully functional um, remains to be seen. Um, we know uh, and 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 Shahid asked about the the payers' role in this. Why do we want payers to participate? There were thirty eight payers that participated in the first CPC, and guess what? They were crabby a lot of the time um, on 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 the initial CPC. Those data reports um, that that they were expected to give to practices looked a lot different than the Medicare um, reports back to practices. So that practice doing all the work to transform still had to had to sift through all kinds of data, often not in 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 real time. Um, that was found to be an impediment. Um, David, to 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 another point you made about the cost, these practices weren't given upfront funding. They were given a care management free fee that was risk adjusted, but the infrastructure that they needed to put into place was, was expensive and it came out of those practices bottom lines. And that's another improvement in CPC plus in being able to advance payment. And by the way, those practices lose the payment to, to your point about quality. CMS is willing to upfront you some payment but if you don't meet their quality measures, you'll lose those funds on the back end. And so really using a, 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 um, a, a little bit of a, of a play from the playbook on behavioral economics, I think was, was a move that CMS made. It's, it's, we hope, going to be a good one. None of these things are easy. And, and back to that June 1 date that payers need to get signed up. We want payers to get signed up and we recognize that there is, there is unanimity of opinion that we need to shift from fee for service. Well, now it's time to put your money where your mouth is. And so CMS has an opportunity, the, the payers have an opportunity. This, this track two for those payers that wanna get in the game, this is their opportunity to demonstrate that they can, can put some sort of a global payment risk adjusted in place to shift us from fee for service. And, and David, I suspect um, that the, the years three and four CPC um, evaluation will give us even more data that tell us whether or not um, the, the, the opportunities at a regional level um, 
those practices that saved money early on, are they going to keep saving? We're, we're very, we're very anxious to see that. Those practices that didn't see savings, what did we, what did we learn from that? Um, it is not an exact science and, and the proof right, of concept right. is, is still very much yeah. um, at play. Right. I mean, I, I, I appreciate all the things that you said. And I, I also know that in other, in other demos, I'm thinking about sort of broader MSSP mm -hmm. projects. Um, we've seen sort of the same thing. I mean, it's been, it's been more than two years now and a lot of them are just not working. And a lot of the early participants have dropped out because it wasn't working for them. Um, ones for whom it did work is sort of unclear why it worked. And I'm thinking now back to the early demos that preceded the ACA as well. Um, some worked great and some didn't work at all. Um, and, uh, it's sort of a continuing conundrum. It's hard to know what is actually going to work. You know, I'm a big believer that, you know, this is the right way to go, yeah. but I also want to see it backed up with some data. So assuming that we're going to get from here to there over the, if, if we have a chance to look into and dig into the last two years of data from CPC Classic, then CPC Plus is in fact something that's moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Then to circle back to, to Shahid's uh, questions, you know, how, how do we get there from here? What do we need to do? And the, uh, you know, bring the, uh, bring other payers into the mix and bringing multiple regions beyond the initial seven into the mix are very important, uh, both in terms of the uh, um, Center for Innovation's mandate to experiment. And uh, as we uh, said in the tweet chat preceding this blab, you know, just sort of throw throw enough spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a certain element of that that continues in all of this. Uh, though, frankly, I, I would hope that we'd get relatively quickly to a point where we, where we believe that we're actually doing something that definitely has uh, value. But again, the next step is to figure out how do we get the payers involved? Which payers are going to be involved? Are they going to be payers who've been involved in the seven uh, initial regions? Are these payers that have broader footprints? Are other regional payers going to get into the action? Um, I would expect that some other regional payers would like to get into the action here uh, so that it's not just left to a handful of larger uh, uh, payers that just expand nationally. Um, then the question about uh, IT requirements. Um, there's been a, a, a huge sea change in health IT uh, moving away from the EHR as the be all and end all, particularly as we're looking at a move away from fee for service payment where the EHR is not just the uh, you know, collecting of documentation and adjunct or billing vehicle. Um, but there's so many tools and so many interesting different ways of communicating with patients today uh, and having patients communicate with clinicians, not just through an EHR portal certified under meaningful use, but through a variety of HIPAA secure apps uh, that do everything from you know, uh, um, you know, capture uh, asynchronous uh, video or other communications between patients and clinicians, and also the the apps that very cleverly leverage the other uh, tools available on our smartphones, so that uh, if the smartphone sits on your bedside table for two weeks and doesn't move around very much, you get a call from a nurse and says, "Well, are you sick in bed? What's going on?" Uh, that's the tremendous value of some of these tools. And as more and more smart people think about how to leverage those tools, those go into the broader toolbox of health IT. So it's not just about uh, a souped up EHR. It's not just about an easily used PHR. It's thinking way outside the box to add tools to the toolbox and um, you know, figuring out how do we use all of that to, to, to leverage the information that we do have and that we don't yet have in order to improve care and reduce costs. That's really the challenge that's in front of all of us right now, I think. It is, and, and uh, here at the, at the summit, uh, the, one of the board members, I believe it's the uh, president of the AMA, uh, uh, American Medical Association, specifically the AMA I'm referring to, uh, he was talking about how as physicians, 
uh, they're, um, they need to move away from seeing EHRs. Uh, if you thought, thought about it from a planetary system perspective, the EHRs as the sun, and we've got to turn the EHR into Pluto. Um, and so, uh, and that's from the physician's point of view. And, they, and he talked a lot about the uh, complaints uh, that uh, we all, all, all know about. But I think three, the three themes have come up from what you guys have uh, started talking about. Theme number one is, is any of this worth trying? Um, and to me, because this is coming out of the innovations team, I actually like the idea that the government, instead of saying, we know what's best, here, go do this, they're saying, we think we have an idea of what might be working, and we're going to keep throwing things against the wall to see what's right. I like that. I'm an engineer. I like that, and I wouldn't change that for the world because mistakes start to happen when you say, I know this and now I'm going to uh, present this to you, which the government does all the time. <laughs> so that's, that, that's, that's theme number one and, and, and worth discussing is, and that's why I brought it up to say, well, should we be making the case? Like I'm sitting here at the uh, Kaiser uh, Innovation Center and Kaiser does exactly what the government wants uh, people to try here, which is comprehensive primary care. Right. Take people, uh, take care of better people, take care of people better at the start and things get better uh, later on. It's a good thesis uh, and I think that works. So you see uh, folks from Geisinger, Kaiser, et cetera, practicing what they preach. What's really hard, and this theme number two is, uh, if it is worth trying, who do we recommend go try this? Should we say that it is health plans that are local, more regional, et cetera, or health plans that are national? Is it large practices or is it small practices that should try this? So two or three practices get together, like the track two model says, put multiple practices together and uh, experiment there where track one says, you can do this between just a, a smaller number of payers and providers. I think that's, uh, that's a worthy conversation. Who do we recommend specifically uh, to say, go try this? And then track three, uh, the theme, the third theme that we've just talked about is, how do we make this work uh, in a information exchange capacity? Is it direct as a protocol that's going to make all this happen with CCDs and CDA, et cetera? Or is this not going to happen until more and more implementations of traditional EDI with HL7 or more implementations of FIRE come about? And what I really liked at the summit today is being very specific, and, and, and I can't remember who said it yesterday uh, at, at the talk, uh, uh, but folk, everybody uh, is here, like ONC is here, FDA is here, so lots of government folks and uh, lots of commercial uh, folks uh, as well. But somebody made a really good uh, point yesterday is that interoperability, you know, we're signing all these crazy pledges and everything else. Interoperability is not a destination and it's not a journey. It's a feature. Do you do it or do you not do it? It's not, it's not a vision. It's not something that you can feel good about. Either you do the damn thing or you don't do it. So that's what I think uh, we should look at and say, is, is CPC worthless if we don't have uh, these uh, exchanges? And what specific exchanges do we have to do? Like in my payer, um, I was sitting through uh, the uh, payer work groups uh, rather than the uh, clinician work group. I know that work group much better. But uh, the number one thing that came up with payers is I need to be able to exchange quality data. Well, that's that's a nice to have. It's a very good discussion, and, and I'm sure that uh, we'd love to do it. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean that we need a, um, that we need a set of uh, fire-based resources that you can connect to and send quality measures, receive quality measures, or does that mean that we do things like do aggregate analysis of patients? So in this third theme, if we're saying that we need this data exchange, what specifically do we need? Not generically, like I need patient data. No, what three things about the patient do you need in order to get CPC to work? What nine things about the patient do I need on a daily basis? And this happens with ACOs as well. Everybody says I need interoperability. I need to do data exchange. That's, that's meaningless. It doesn't make any sense to say that. What we have to be very, very specific about is in order to be successful, payers need to give this information in these fields, in these buckets, with these schemas, and then uh, providers need to exchange and provide this. So what we're learning here, and this is why I'm taking a little bit longer time uh, explaining this, is sitting here with everybody uh, talking about one thing, and that is FIRE. Not HL7 EDI, but FIRE and how it's going to make this happen shows that they're serious. What we're lacking is, are the 
smaller, um, minimal standards that fire is putting into place, which is good. Do the minimum necessary, not, not the maximum, but are the minimums defined well enough to be able to execute on what we want to execute, like an ACO, like CBC plus, like CCM, etc. Or are we doing what uh, engineers sometimes mistakenly, engineers like us sometimes mistakenly do, which is develop the standard and hope that it might be used. So what I really <laughs> liked about today, before showing up here uh, and mostly been reading, and, and of course I, I, I do this kind of work on a daily basis, so I'm at a lot of facilities, I see what the messages that are being exchanged, I can see that FHIR, unlike in many other cases, we're saying, here's the data we need, here's the exchange I need to do, now let's go define it and, and get some agreement uh, in the same way that we've done um, in many other cases, rather than sit back, define the big scope of what we might do in the future, put it down on paper, do the specifications, and hope and pray that somebody understands it well enough to be able to use it. So let's talk about those, the those three themes. Um, theme number one, should we do it, yes or no? Uh, and uh, and start with that. And so, who would you guys say, Don? If if you've seen uh, you know any particular providers or payers that you think should this, should we go regional? Should we go size? Should we go by population? What are your thoughts? Um, back on theme number one, where where I'm very curious right now is from the result from CPC. We we're only looking at claims from CMS. Uh, is the data from those private payers not available? Uh, and if so. Um, you know, from the first two years, it wasn't available. Is it going to be available in the next two years, or are they planning on doing something about that EPC plus? Uh, that kind of lends itself to question number two, because if I'm a payer, why do I want to get involved in this if the results are kind of wishy-washy, kind of unclear from my perspective, and I'm only getting to see what happened in the Medicare population? So what 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 are, what are the other pairs saying from the seven original regions of CPC that they have a good experience um, I know I just came across Cigna who had written out of their Colorado effort that CMS should definitely not do this and should not expand on the program they had a couple of very specific points that they they were concerned about uh, first being that they thought the uh, the payments were higher than the the market would have actually set on its own that they needed to make uh, on the for member per month uh, they said the data aggregation aspect of the tier point Shahid was much more expensive than they originally expected. Mm -hmm. uh, that ended up being a much bigger problem. And then they said that the providers, when given a choice between <clears throat> a, pro a similar program they designed themselves and CPC tended to go towards their self-designed program. And then lastly, uh, to some, someone mentioned uh, Krabby. Uh, uh, I think that was you, Marcy, so the pairs were Krabby. They said getting all of these people to the table on a monthly basis and getting them to talk about the issues and come to a consensus was painful, for lack of a better word. So I, so. I just feel compelled to respond because the, the, it's, it's not that what you've said, Don, is untrue, but it is, it is the problem in, in healthcare, which is we are looking at our own bottom line in a siloed way that that with all due respect to Cigna, of course, if you're a payer, you would focus on your what's easiest for you. But if you look at the patient, the consumer, and the practice that's trying to provide care to them, I, I learned medicine. I didn't really learn medicine. I learned public health. So full disclosure, I'm not, I'm not a physician. But, but the, the, the physicians and nurse practitioners I talked to went to school to, to offer care to people who need it. And, and when they've got 15 different payers who pay them all differently and expect different measures uh, to be reported back to them, now we've got physicians uh, leading primary care in droves because they are so burned out. So why Cigna or any other regional or national plan needs to, needs to play ball is because one, healthcare is local, all local. So you've got to be at the local level, working together with other clinicians, with consumers, um, and with the payers to decide what can our region do to offer the best care so that primary care practices are listening to 10 
different sets of requirements, and we can let those clinicians actually focus on delivering care. So, so that's my answer back to Cigna. But Don, you are right. It is hard work. It, mm -hmm. All those weekly meetings, monthly meetings, um, if you look at them in the short term, yes, they're crabby. But you look at folks who have held on in these multi-payer, whether that is CPC or, or MAPSIP, and what you find is such a sense of collaboration and teamwork that extends beyond the project in front of them, but creates communities where people get to know one another, trust one another. I was just at a conference yesterday where I got to hear the experience in Colorado. So specific to, to uh, uh, electronic health information exchange, what they've been doing for several years now is informally uh, working together as payers, both with Medicare, but with, with the commercial plans and deciding here's what we want to do in Colorado to exchange information and not have government requirements placed on top. We'll decide locally, but ultimately getting to a place back to your question, Shahid, about, about whether or not you need to build in exchanges. Ultimately, what they decided is if you want to serve the whole state of Colorado, You've you've got to bring in a governance structure that allows you to have agreement because any one player in a marketplace can go by its own standards, offer its own kind of payment, um, and and only take care of its own beneficiaries. But that will not lead to long term. Um, population health improvements, nor will it lead to cost savings. And it certainly doesn't lead to collaboration across the very broken, fragmented healthcare system that can only be fixed at a local slash regional level. So, Marcy, who pays? Everybody pays. For that infrastructure. Is it out of the couple bucks PM, PM, or is it something else? So um, it's 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 something else. So you've got your PMPM, PM, and you're right, David. It's it's a couple of bucks. It's risk adjusted, but it only bumps up to a little more than four bucks. Um, but if if you are taking care of complex patients, you've got an opportunity for a hundred dollars PM PM. Again, if you're taking care of really sick patients. And you are willing to be accountable for their social needs, psychosocial needs, helping those patients um, with whatever it is they need in order to keep them out of the hospital, out of the ER. Um, and it's not just it's not just government that pays. And this is the beauty of a multi-payer. You've got CMS paying. You've got the state paying on behalf of Medicaid, and you've got commercial payers. But Let's face it, we also are asking consumers to pay more and more and more. So these are, these are also patients and consumers and employers who are paying, and they want better outcomes. They're tired of paying more than any other industrialized country, almost twice as much, and having crappy outcomes. Um, until we're all willing to look at this from the perspective of, of a social good and what we can do together to improve health, we're going to continue with, hey, what's best for me? What's best for my bottom line? And we're going to spend twice as much money. The opportunity costs are incredible for employers. Employers right. aren't going right. so, so to is, is, is a hundred bucks. Is a hundred bucks enough? I mean, the the uh, CCM program with uh, Medicare for 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 elders with multiple chronic conditions, forty two bucks and change, regionally adjusted per month. Um, that was seen by many when the program was kicked off as insufficient yeah. uh, of to to deliver the care. And here we're talking about potentially even more complex uh, patients mm -hmm. and. Uh, partly as a result of the ins insufficient reimbursement and perhaps also as a result of the, um, you know, bureaucracy and the say. technical difficulties. Uh, I think the, the most recent figure I've seen is that 13% of eligible uh, Medicare members and pr treating providers are, are, are taking advantage of CCM. Yeah, and we're they what? Are. We're like, you know, what is it, a year and a half, two years after this has gone into effect? This was going to be the uh, the jillion dollar project for everybody involved in senior care. It's, it, it hasn't taken. So 
We we never thought so. First of all, you're 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 building that program on a broke chassis. Fee for service mm -hmm. is not the way to go. Right. So the administrative burden to those practices to actually bill for that code was was a hassle. And more importantly, you had you had copays for patients yes. who thought they should already be getting those services. Right. So asking people who are already chronically ill, they are not, um, many of those people, if you look at the literature, they are also of low income and asking them to pay a copay every time they go in for those services. Um, and you're right, the 42 bucks PM, PM for really complex patients, not enough. Moreover, we ask, we ask providers to compete with one another. You know how, you, how, how, how the provider who got the CCM code won? by filing first. That was literally how how you got your CCM code. Right, you need somebody to get signed up with uh, with a particular practice. Exactly. And they could sign up with another practice next month and then you have dueling claims being adjudicated. Right. So, um, so I think kind of a mess, yeah. There's, there's better opportunity in track two because you are, um, you, you are uh, one, Building, building that that comprehensive payment in, like I said, on the front end, um, no additional copays. You're not you're not building it on a broken chassis of, of fee for service, um, and hopefully you're integrating and teaching the practice how to offer care that is whole person centered, that that thinks about somebody's behavioral health needs and their social needs. And while you're getting paid to do that for your most complex patients, you're learning how to do that for your whole community. So are there resources available through CMS, through the payers, through your organization, Marcy, in order to help the practices do all of this? Um, not um, sadly, not through my organization. Although um, I'll I'll take whatever contributions um, <laughs> we, we we can get to the cause. Um, uh, no, the the CMS has built into their CPC Plus proposal um, uh, some some learning opportunities and technical support uh, so that those folks can can um, offer those services. And back to Shahid's point earlier, you know they've also asked vendors um, and they've. They've not done this before. They've acknowledged the role of information technology being so critical to this that not only do the practices that want to be track two practices have to get their vendor to sign something saying, I'm in, I'm in a partner with you, but the vendors themselves need to sign something to commit to CMS that they're in. And so um, I'm, 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 not often a skeptic, but I get very skeptical in the world of HIT, um, and and um, I'm 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 a growing optimist um, that this list of vendors who are truly committed to population health are are going to be able to differentiate themselves by signing up and getting out early and saying I'm in, we're part of the solution. HIT has been telling us they're the solution for 30 years. So I want them to be a big part of the solution now and they got to start sharing data and and they and they've got to be willing to to partner because to Don's point earlier. This this is a lot of work. You're meeting weekly, maybe not weekly. You're meeting monthly. You you got to be all in. And and one thing we haven't talked about today and it is the key to every patient-centered medical home initiative we have ever looked at. Every single one. And it's leadership Leadership and culture change are, are, are the secret sauce that CMS doesn't have good measures for, sadly. Um, and we see in way too many practices, you'll get, a, you'll get a local champion, they'll be driving change, and then they leave. And, 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 the, and, and the initiative topples. And, and this is why multi-payers, where we've got lots of folks who have skin in the game, who care about this, they come together and say, this, is, this has to be more than about one leader. This, this has to be about all our leadership. Right. And Don, you, you presented a question. I think it was in uh, uh, your uh, write-up for the week, wondering uh, how many health IT vendors uh, who had to sign this MOU would go in. Uh, and, and, and to echo Mark's point around vendors, we've been saying for decades that uh, if only you used our EHR or only you used my solution, that it right. would improve co reduce costs, improve revenue, improve quality, et cetera. We've never actually, as you know, as a, as a vendor in the field for a long time, 
we've never been held to almost anything that we actually uh, espouse. In this particular case, uh, Don, do you want to ask that question about the MOU? It's, it's probably worth uh, wondering out yeah, loud. absolutely. Uh, and you know, as, as a health IT vendor myself, that one jumped out at me right away. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I, I really like the fact that uh, for a track two application, it has to come with something written from the mm -hmm. health IT vendor that says they're on board. Not because of the commitment that it makes between the health IT vendor and CMS or public or anybody else, but just because that'll prove that somebody applying for a track two application has sort of this stuff out with the health IT vendor. So it's showing them going through the process. And I think that's really valuable. So I, I applaud CMS for that one. The MOU one, I do, I, 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 I see that as a very questionable approach. Um, one, because we don't really know what they're going to ask the, in that commitment, you know, I assume it's going to be kind of, uh, you know, like the, the, the big uh, interop uh, commitments that we've seen groups mm -hmm. make where they all kind of say, yeah, we're on work and interop. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice ocean and everything else, but it, doesn't, it still doesn't really make it really accountable. It's just a, a public declaration, if you will. Um, but I do worry a little bit that it might uh, scare some of the smaller groups away. And when you're talking about uh, transformation and things like that, you don't want to scare away startups. You don't want to scare away people with new ideas. Uh, and whenever you, the, the more kind of process you put around a, a bid or the more, uh, more, more things I have to do to throw my hat in the ring, that's going to uh, pull in the, the old boys more than it's going to pull in the, 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 the new ups there. But so, it, yeah, will pull, it will pull in the courageous and that MOU is not legally binding. It is a document that says HIT is important. HIT has to be a part of the solution. And and like Shay just said, they've been all, they've been telling us for a long, long time they're the, they're the answer. And and when when integrated right, based on the patient's needs and the and the clinician's needs to offer care, they they are a critical part of the solution. You can't do population health without data. But when done wrong. You can't take care of the patient in front of you. You are so busy, you know, filling out filling out your your iPad and your check boxes. When when medicine is transactional, when it's checkbook, we, and you you don't have your eyes on the patient, and you're not not talking to them about what they care about, we've missed it. And they leave walking out the door without us having addressed their 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 real issue. Yeah, hey, David, um, uh, uh, Marcy mentioned it's not legally binding. Having a lawyer on the call, <laughs> what, what, mm -hmm. how would you uh, uh, suggest uh, some startups and others looking at uh, this kind of uh, memo or this kind of working relationship? Would you recommend it or would you tell people to stay away? I would say th I would recommend looking at it very closely because it's really it's aspirational. It's not it's not binding, as we've said. And the goal is to build a bunch of tools and bring them online within the first two years of a five year um, demo. Um, so it's a learning opportunity for vendors. <clears throat> it's a building opportunity, as Marcy said earlier, uh, we don't necessarily expect stuff to be working perfectly by the conclusion of one of these demos. Um, the CM CMMI is in the business of, uh, of throwing tremendous amounts of money against the wall to see if they can move the needle somehow. So why not get on the bus is sort of my, my attitude. Um, part of me says, part of me feels like, well, you know, we're not really solving the problems here, or we don't know if we're solving the problems. But if we look at this in sort of the more macro view, where this is sort of part of an ongoing experiment, then that's okay. We're not expecting to solve the problems today. But here's a chance to get on the bus, build some new tools. And again, as Marcy said, you don't want to break the workflow. You want to build things that are intuitive and and uh, beautiful and easy to use and that sort of make sense, can plug into the legacy workflow as appropriate. You don't want people logging in and out of multiple systems as, as when they're in a single uh, patient visit. You don't want patients, you know, I mean, most patients don't log into their portals because they're a pain in the neck or you get a an email alert from your 
physician's office that says there's a message for you on the portal and it's a pain in the neck to, to log in and what do you what do you access uh, sometimes it's real garbage uh, the message that's there that's waiting for you um, there has to be easier ways and there are already easier ways um, of, of communicating with people we all we all know about these things I work with a lot of uh, digital health companies that are building these kinds of tools so um, this is not we're not starting from scratch here uh, but the, so the question is how do we how do we integrate the EHR data not only from within a particular uh, physician practice but from all of the providers who a uh, patient who's likely to benefit from this sort of program is seeing. And again, we're talking about people with multiple chronic conditions, multiple providers, multiple portals, multiple EHRs. There's an integration issue. There's an interoperability issue. And again, there's the, the question of how do we build stuff on top of that that's, that's useful and helpful. But again, just going back to the purely... Um, Legal, it's uh, it's it's aspirational. So a vendor's involvement is not going to, uh, you know, land them in hot water if they're unable to deliver on the tech. Uh, it may land the provider in hot water. They may be coughing up some prepaid incentives, and so a uh, vendor is not going to be in hot water with the federales, but they're going to be in hot water presumably contractually with a provider organization, which if they're on the ball, will be making their vendors responsible for delivering the goods. Yeah, so what we saw a few years ago is um, a, a, a little bit of a, a ACO washing across products where when ACOs were announced, uh, everybody that had never heard of an ACO, all of a sudden in 2011, 2012, were experts at how to- We're experts, right. right? <laughs> we're, we're about to see that this summer. Uh, yes. CPC plus, even though this didn't exist up until last week, as Marcy said. So uh, one danger here is uh, overshooting. And this is why I think as, as, as an audience, what we should look at and say is embrace the idea that this is coming out of CMMI, which is the innovation team at CMS. Embrace that these are experiments. Don't say that you know stuff when you don't know, right? I mean, we, it, we don't know what the outcome here is going to be. We have some assertions. We have a thesis, uh, and, and we're going after that thesis. Right. So it, I would almost recommend, and this might be a good uh, you know, wrapping up position of the next few minutes, is should we tell and what kind, and maybe Marcy, you could tell us, who would you say are the target providers that should look into themselves and say, hey, I got to run with this program. Let me go find a payer to work with. Let me go find uh, two or three providers if you want to, you know, if you want to say something about the track one, track two. Don and uh, David, maybe you can talk a little bit about what uh, digital health providers, if you're a small EHR uh, player that's having trouble in your market um, growing because there are a lot bigger vendors out there, should you become the leader and go get 10 practices together you connect them with the payers that you're working with because as an EHR vendor, you're seeing both. If you're if you're the RCM and EHR together, you see everything that uh, uh, the two sides are seeing. Do you want to be the connector, sign the MOUs with them, move them along, and become the integrator? Help with training, help with service, help with support. This is a new line of business that we've never had before uh, in comprehensive primary care that is allowing non-integrated systems uh, such as multiple providers, multiple payers to look like uh, where I'm sitting here right now, like a Kaiser or like a Geisinger. And that to me seems like a pretty big opportunity for, uh, I think Marcy said it a couple of times, is those innovators who are willing to take that risk on the digital health side may win in 2017 and 2018 when they couldn't even compete in 2016. So uh, Marcy, just a couple of uh, minutes about uh, who do you think, who are the providers that you think should look at themselves and say, if I am a X, primary care, of course, right? So tell me, so if, I, if you're a primary care, definitely be looking at this program. If you're primary care with N number of doctors, Y number of patients, a specific kind of patient population, who should be looking at this in serious? Well, so the first thing first, back to the noon first date. So you will only have access to participate in this program if there are enough uh, commercial payers in your marketplace that, that sign up. 
So um, recognize that we that we're gro- we're growing from seven to twenty regions across the country, but but it is still that demo, um, and and so um, you've got to be in a place that that's got some innovators in terms of the of the commercial marketplace. Um, this is not a program. CPC Plus is is not a program uh, for. Folks in 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 practice who haven't already started at least a little way down the path toward innovation. You've got to have certified electronic health records. You've got to have some experience. Um, as a matter of fact, as as you were talking, I was looking at at the list. The top one requirements are, um, as I mentioned, you've got to have an EHR. There's got to be payers in your marketplace, and you've got to have. Um, care delivery activities ongoing, that that you're already assigning patients to a provider panel, you're already providing 24-7 access for patients, and that can be telephonic, um, and uh, that you're going to support quality improvement activities. Um, so, so you're eligible to participate if you're, if you're doing that. Track two, on top of that, You've also got to be using care plans in your practice. Um, you've got to be following up with patients uh, who have gone to the emergency department or have been discharged from the hospitals. And you've got to have some plan in place uh, that links your patients to community-based resources, as well as, I, as I'd mentioned before, um, you've got to have uh, uh, your HIT vendor willing to play ball. Having said all that, what the science tells us about um, doing this sort of practice transformation work, and it makes sense, is this is harder for smaller practices. This is team-based care. That's sort of a, a fundamental concept to understand. Primary care physicians, nurse practitioners are already so overloaded in a fee-for-service world where they're seeing patients every 15 minutes. We can't ask them to see to see more patients in our We've got to be we've got to be using the team in a way that is smarter and um, and and actually delegates. Um, and this is real team work I'm talking about here, not just throwing a bunch of providers together and calling them a team. So it's harder in rural areas and it's small. It's harder for smaller practices because they don't have as many members of the team. And this is where, again, we come back to technology and whether technology provides us with some opportunity to build out that team virtually. And, and just this call today, it's so freaky to me. I've never done a call like this before. It's so distracting to see me. Mostly I'd be okay if I did this. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of this, um, um, but technology gives us options we haven't had before for those practices. Um, the last point I would make is for practices who want to learn. They, they want to learn. They want to be cutting edge. Those are the folks who, who should sign up because the, the, the payment reform here is real. And back to David's question about is 100 bucks per member per month enough for your most complex patients? We don't know. That we 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 hope, um, and and we'll have a lot more to learn from CPC Plus, and we're grateful for the learning of for all those practices that participated in CPC Classic. Yeah, and, and Don, I'd like to have you, you know, kind of like uh, 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 rope us in to conclude over the next minute or so. But I was hoping to make an open invitation. Uh, this would be a great uh, platform if you are a practice or you're a payer. And you want to wonder out loud <laughs> with a team like this to say, should I get into this? What are, what should we look at, et cetera? Uh, the, the only way this is going to work is we have to do it as a community. Nobody knows how this is going to end. So let's think about this. Let's do some open-ish, open source-ish kinds of design where we get together. And uh, if you're coming up with a contract or coming up with a plan, you're saying, should I do this or should I not? Share that with us, right? Uh, we can publish it. Uh, Don and I do a bunch of writing on the technology end, uh, David the master on the on the legal front. Uh, you've got a patient expert as far as uh, primary care is concerned with Marcy as well. So uh, join us here at, 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 at this platform or open your own lab, right? Have a weekly mm-hmm. session where you can invite patients and say, would you participate? You can invite providers and payers in an open way. I mean, in healthcare, we have these discussions, but we often are sitting behind closed doors mm-hmm. hoping to get input and who's going to Who's going to come and knock on a closed door? It's not going to happen. And, so and I feel so close to you all right now. We could we could solve the problems of the world. Absolutely. <laughs> We've got Blab. <laughs> well, I love Blab. Yeah. And I'm yeah. Blabby. So it fits right in. <laughs> well, I hope you're not scaring people away, Shade. <laughs> <laughs> too much, too much openness. 
Thank you for your openness, yes. And speaking of openness, I have to run back to my uh, HL7 uh, session here that's uh, already started about 10 minutes ago. So I'm going to jump off, but uh, our, our friends here, uh, Don, uh, you can uh, rope this in and, and answer, hopefully, the question, David, who on the technology side should be uh, doing this? And uh, I will see you guys then next week, uh, but I got to run. All right. Thanks. 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 Yeah, I'll, I'll throw just like uh, one minute on the technology side is it appears that CMS is not going to try to be prescriptive on the technology side. And they are opening up the doors on that front, which I think is a really good move. Um, and a departure from what we did with MU. Um, yeah, I was going to say we all know how that worked out, right? Yeah, that caused some 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 weird platforms to be built for sure, and things that were not usable. So I think with that out of, out of the way, that does create some opportunities for the startups and you know the, the not huge companies to get involved in and do some of the stuff. So I think that's a plus. Mm -hmm. uh, David, your point earlier, uh, uh, there tends to be a lot of money here. Um, could be enticing or two is absolutely true yeah it, it's 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 an opportunity for a company to get in and solve a specific problem and grow um so i would, I would encourage uh people to look at it from that aspect for sure uh especially though this is going to be a five-year program with up to uh five thousand practices so that's basically five thousand groups that are going to need to do this that don't know how to do it and uh many of them having their experience uh through MU with uh, some of the big players are going to shy away from them too. So that's going to open up some some, some opportunities. So I would encourage uh, IT vendors, uh, certainly in the uh, telemedicine space, to get involved. I think that that uh, hybrid model on the on the stage two for the payments um, or track two, sorry, creates some opportunities, some new new and different things there. And I would think people will look to see how they can take care of uh, take telemedicine into it. Uh, possibly some tracking. I know that there's a lot of issues there, but like. Uh, you know, tracking tracking folks when they're not in the office and, and the arts, uh, things like that. I think it could have some potential in the coming years. Uh, but big ones would be communication. I think that's going to help these care teams uh, collaborate, um, but especially outside of the office, would be huge. And then my last comment is um, on the smaller practices, they don't have staff dedicated to picking IT resources. They've got a couple of providers, they've got a couple of office managers, they can't deal with this stuff. And if they want to participate in these programs, we need to deliver them some uh, lightweight, easy to set up, like SaaS based type applications. Yeah. Uh, it can't be, you know, weeks and month long uh, implementations and integrations and everything right. else. So right. I would encourage yeah. find that, that so, new solution, something you can solve completely um, lightly. And uh, it's going to have to be semi inexpensive for these small groups. So those, are, those are the folks I would encourage to get involved. Right. Fortunately, a number of the cloud based EHR companies have begun to open up integrations for other health IT vendors to build extensions like the things that are going to be needed to optimize participation in an initiative like CPC plus. So that's really going to be the route to go. And presumably many of the practices that would be likely contenders for this uh, project are using such EHRs and uh, other uh, companies that are building the integrations and the additional tools, like many of the uh, clients that I work with on a regular basis, uh, are going to be likely contenders to step up and sign these letters of support and uh, MOUs. Very good. Okay. Um, any, any tired comments for you? I know we're, we're a few minutes over like we are every week, so we'll probably <laughs> wrap it up. Um, Marcy, anything on, on the way out? No, thank you for the invitation. And um, we'll be tracking this very closely at, at my organization. We are, um, I failed to mention, we're a... We're a not-for-profit membership organization. We're kind of the little engine that could, and we'll be nudging. Um, we'll be nudging this work along. So um, keep me posted if uh, if there's some some work we ought to be doing um, to help the HIT world stay connected. Because um, primary care needs you, just like you spelled out. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for coming, especially on the short notice. And uh, yeah, if we if we come back around this topic, which I suspect we will, we'll definitely keep you posted and and possibly see if you you want to come back on and talk about both. Terrific. Thanks, guys. Okay.
Thank you. Pleasure to meet you, Marcy. Um, I dropped a couple of links in the in the margin here uh, about an upcoming uh, edition of Regular Blab that I'm starting, that I've started to host, and also a webinar that I'll be participating in. Um, These will be uh, virtually back to back in a in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for stopping in, David. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we'll we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye.